What's up, everybody? Welcome back to our Orange Bloods YouTube channel. I'm Jason Sukamel. That's Cole Patterson. If you don't know us by now, back for another recruiting episode on our uh, Orange Bloods YouTube channel. Do it again. Shameless plugs or requests here, but hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. We're trying to rack up as many subscribers on this thing as we can. Uh, we promised you last week, Cole, we were pretty sloppy about doing these videos for, for about a month there with the holidays and COVID and travel and any other excuse I can come up with. But um, you know, we said, hey, we're going to start doing these more often. And we did one last Tuesday, the night, yeah. the night before signing day. It's the following Tuesday afternoon. Um, so we're going to recap last signing day, and then we're going to talk about some guys that you and I talked to this week. Um, not a lot to recap from last week, is there? There's one new addition to the class, uh, a guy we've talked about a ton, DJ Campbell. I'm going to let you start us off, man. I mean, your impressions on adding Devon Campbell, offensive lineman, five-star offensive lineman. You were at his signing ceremony, Cole, so you were there uh, front and center. Kind of your thoughts on Texas adding DJ Campbell to the mix. Yeah, like you said, not a lot to report on, but I think you made the reference, you know, last week that might not be a lot of fireworks, but it's one, you know, huge explosion. I mean, just, you know, Campbell, you know, is the highest rated guy in Texas class. He immediately became that, you know. He's the highest ranked offensive lineman. Um, so a huge, you know, addition for Sarkeesian, for Kyle Flood, for really the whole program. Um, but yeah, you know, Campbell, he's a, you know, he's a man of a few words. You know, he didn't really drag out his announcement ceremony. Um, they asked him where he was going. He immediately pulled out his hat and got it over with. You know, he, <laughs> I like that though. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. He didn't do the whole. He didn't even have hats on the table. You know, he didn't have yeah. tech. He just went under because he had it in his bag. He unveiled it, and that was that. You know, he obviously took a couple questions. But he's a good dude, great player, and I think that's a huge, you know, addition to Texas. He's a player that I think we both expect to play at least some point, perhaps even start at some point during the year, if not day one. He's going to be an impact player and, you know, great great kid to root for. Just talking to his family. They're all very grateful for the opportunity. They all mention that Texas education is a big reason why he signed. they not really big into the NIL or the fanfare. They're just ready to get him on campus, ready to get him to work. And I think uh, every Texas fan is pretty excited about that. Yeah, and then they should be literally the highest ranked offensive lineman in 20 years of Rivals.com rankings, the highest one Texas has ever signed. He's number 14 nationally. Uh, Justin Blaylock was the highest at number 15. So if he's a fraction of the player Justin Blaylock was for Texas, uh, UT fans will be excited about that. And Hey, I man, it's a guy that's literally kind of gray in the beard here, as you can see. Um, I like the no games and the no gimmicks. I, I Nothing I hate more when a guy has five hats on or, he tries one on and then throws it on the floor. And I'm like, dude, don't disrespect the coaches that have busted their ass recruiting. It just drives me. That's what my old man rant, yelling at clouds, <laughs> coming out. Okay, get off my lawn. I, I kind of agree with you there. Though. <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah, I, think, I think it's cool to have some hats on the table. Yeah, I don't see the purpose of throwing a hat or, you know, no, like, man, like, put a hat on and, like, you know, unveil a different shirt, stuff like that. <laughs> yes. If I was ever guiding a recruit and or a family member – just be respectful, man. Those coaches have put in a lot of time and a lot of energy. So yeah. good on DJ Campbell. Good on his family, man. He had good support system around him and good advice. And um, you mentioned he wants to just get to work. You mentioned that this is interesting, kind of an interesting segue, and we're going to transition pretty quickly. Um, he said that the NIL money, his family, I think, said it wasn't that big of a deal. Yeah. I actually talked to Cam Williams, who signed with Texas in December. Cameron Williams, big lineman out of Duncanville. Uh, to my three, two, one column on Orange Bloods today. Um, Cam's always great to talk to. He's, he's a really good interview. He doesn't do a lot, but he's, for some reason, he seems to pick up when I call him. So I, I like him. So, um, yeah. but we, one of the things we talked about, we kind of reflected on his decision to commit to Texas. Uh, he flipped from Oregon, like Kelvin Banks. But I asked him, I said, hey, I'm curious how much of a factor was this? Uh, I think it's the pancake factory. Is that what they call it? I should know that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, Pancake Factory, the NIL deal where offensive linemen are going to get 50K, I think it's each year. <laughs> and Cam told me, he said, hey, man, it wasn't even 1%. It wasn't a factor at all. He goes, man, that money's going to come regardless if you play well. Uh, it was more about finding a fit that he liked. It was more about Kyle Flood and Sark staying on him after he committed to Oregon in July. I said, well, how, when you said they stayed on you, Cam, I said, how much are we talking? 
He said every single day they reached out to him. I was like, wow, man, that's pretty amazing effort. But I thought it was pretty incredible to hear from him. He goes, man, the, the NIL deal didn't play a factor at all. And I said, Cam, I told him, that's a lot of money, dude. 50 K, man. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a lot of money, especially for a teenager, man. Exactly, yeah. And then he kind of goes, yeah, he kind of thought of it. He goes, yeah, it is. <laughs> I said, well, I, I said, what do you got? What are you going to do with that money? I'm sure you've got something earmarked with it, right? And like <laughs> yeah. most teenagers, oh, I'll probably get a car, he said. And yeah. He goes, I don't know what I'll do with the rest. And I said, dude, I'm not supposed to give you recruiting advice, so I'm not going to do that. You're already signed. It wouldn't matter anyway, but I said, I'm going to give you old man advice. Save as much of that money as you can, man. <laughs> Let it yeah. sit there for 20 years. But, uh, but um, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Kind of across the board as we've talked to these um, offensive linemen, then maybe it's because it was so new. I don't know, but it just yeah. didn't seem to have an impact. You know, maybe next year when an offensive lineman comes to visit Texas and he sees Cam Williams rolling around in a $50,000 car, then maybe it has an impact. Maybe he's like, Oh hell, that's pretty badass." but it, it didn't seem to move. Like that or something. Yeah, exactly. But it didn't seem to move the needle a lot. Yeah. Uh, I remember, this- um, I'm talking to Kevin Banks, you know, at the, Houston banquet that was I guess right before signing day maybe a week before he committed he kind of maybe the week that he did commit somewhere you know somewhere in December I think it was the weekend before I remember he went to that yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah, early December and he kind of said something you know that it's cool I guess but he didn't really you know he I guess he realized one that he could probably get NIL money anywhere he went but he Mm -hmm. he didn't really take much consideration into that uh, maybe it's just, you know, maybe they don't want to admit that, you know, they like the money. Probably maybe. the truth of that, yeah. But, I mean, also, I don't think – I think if we're in a new age where, like, one, like you said, so new, and two, if you're a top-level guy like that, like, you're going to get NIO money regardless. And mm-hmm. I think it's – those relationships paid off, you know, I think um, getting – but I think, like, you know, getting Cameron Williams and NATO in Missoula from Allen, I think that's huge for Texas, not just for offensive line, but just, like, breaking through and that – that Dallas, you know, Fort Worth mm-hmm. Metroplex, Adam Campbell, of course. Two schools that Texas has traditionally struggled at. They did get yeah. Jackson a couple of years ago, wound up transferring. But yeah, those are, you know, Duncan Bill and Allen are powerhouses, and Texas doesn't always recruit those schools well. So it's yeah. big to get that. I mean, the, this offensive line class, your, your article saying how historic it is. I don't think, like, it, it's hard to describe how important this class was. Just watching the team last year, just watching how many misses they've had in that, in that position recruiting, getting all these guys together in the same class, you know, sometimes it's hard to stack up a position because of playing time, because of competition. It seems like all everyone that we've talked to like embrace it and they want to play together. They want to, you know, kind of change, you know, the culture. It's pretty incredible that in 20 years, I'm looking at, I have that column, my article pulled up that you referenced about the offensive line group. Two times has Texas signed, a five-star offensive lineman in 20 years. Um, You can make a case that they signed two this year. Rivals dropped Kelvin Banks out of five-star rank, but if you go by the uh, whatever consensus or or whatever they call that, uh, where they kind of aggregate all the, all the um, different rankings, he is a five-star. So to get two five-stars, three rivals, 100 members in this class, rivals is, or Texas has never done three, had three rivals, 100 members. Uh, You got a couple of rivals, 250 members in there in addition. So, just an incredibly talented class. It's a deep class. And when you're talking seven offensive linemen, that's like you said, that's impressive in itself. Cause then it, I keep going back to my conversation with Cameron Williams. I asked him about that. I said, was that like appealing to you? Cause a lot of guys run away from that. They said, nah, that's yeah. too many. I don't want to compete. Camp, guys, yeah, exactly. And Cam said, no, man, in his opinion and other guys he's talked to, they want to come in and be kind of a foundation piece for the program and get it back to championship level. So great job by Kyle Flood, Steve Sarkeesian to close that out with DJ Campbell. Um, let's transition a little bit. Cole, I want to talk about some guys we've talked uh, just quickly, guys we've talked to this week. And then I want to wrap it up, just some questions that fans uh, or readers from Orange Blood sent in. Um, I know you talked to Aaron Hampton, the 2024 yeah. athlete out of uh, Dangerfield. So um, I'll kind of let you uh, talk about that and what your perception is after – communicating with Hampton. Yeah, he's a, you know, 2024 20, guy, so a little bit younger, still has a couple more cycles to go before he signs, obviously, but one of the best, you know, underclassmen in the state, you know, he's kind of blown up recently. Um, I say recently, but, you know, over the past season, over the past fall, you know, Baylor, he committed there for a little bit, for mm-hmm. a month. He said he kind of made a decision too early. 
I think his teammate committed there as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, Arkansas has offered him. He's had some power five SEC interest offers, all that kind of stuff. But you know, good, good kid. He, I think he, ever since talking to him, ever since he first, you know, came on the radar, he's always been pretty high on Texas and he was there for the junior day we were at, uh, at the end of January. And he had a great things to say. He said it wasn't just one coach that came up and talked to him. It was kind of a whole staff effort. Obviously, if you follow him on Twitter, you kind of saw the pictures he tweeted from, you know, Sark's office and all of that. One was he's been very pro Texas on Twitter. Very. Yeah, pro-Texas. yeah. He's. I think that's like. I don't think that's just for sure. Like he says really good things. He told me. I mean, he plays a little bit of receiver as well, some offense. But he told me a lot of people are recruiting him as a as a DB. He says Texas sees him as an athlete, but they also are selling him on like a Buda Baker kind of role. You know, Buda Baker played for, you know, PK up at Washington. So they kind of they kind of have that to sell him on. But yeah, really good player, really good kid to talk to. Uh, I think he's going to be one of those top guys in the state of Texas. And the Longhorns are doing like a great job of laying that early foundation. They'll have to beat out some top teams. But I think Texas is you know, still early, but that early favorite in his recruitment. I know Buda Baker more as an NFL player. I didn't even – didn't even know he played for PK up at Washington. So that's yeah, hey, man, I I something on this video. Was talking about so, oh, yeah, I guess he played up there as well. I should have okay. in an article. But yeah, he uh, played in that that's, scheme and everything. That's a great selling point when you can point yeah. to a guy like that and say, Hey, look what we turned helped turn him into. He's a great player, obviously. So um uh I talked to Cam Williams. I mentioned that another guy I talked to, Cam. I'm I'm kind of tying these two together. Cam played, he told me he played his senior year at Duncanville at 370 pounds. He's down to 360. He wants to get down to 340. You hear 370, you're like, okay, that's an alarm. Red bells going off, right? Or red bells and whistles or whatever. Um, he moves incredibly well for 370. Like I said, he's down to 360. Um, Texas won up to Cam Williams last week when they offered, and I had to write this name down, Samu Tuamana Pepe, who's uh, probably butchered that, but um, he told me to, to, he told me how to say it. And I go, dude, I'm never going to remember that. So, <laughs> but a uh, really nice kid, but uh, out of At- Atascacita, he's a defensive lineman, was 390 pounds. He's down yeah. to 380. He camped at Texas in the summer and he was coming off an injury. So he, he said he was just terribly out of shape, but he's at 380 right now. They offered him as a defensive tackle. Uh, pretty open <clears throat> 2023 guy, but does like Texas a lot, likes Oregon a lot. He did visit Oregon, but uh, Bo Davis is trying to do some work there. Another kind of, defense- tying, kind of I didn't mean to interrupt, but kind of tying in that Buda Baker and PK Washington defense and all that, uh, kind of like Vita Vey, you know, yeah. he's 350 pounds, played that nose tackle in that scheme. So perhaps that's where they kind of see him, you know, and that same kind of role, same kind of ability. So it, you know, he, he, it, it makes sense. He would fit like, as you said, um, and I said, Hey, what do you think you do well? And he goes, I clog up like all the gaps. Another defensive tackle they offered at the junior day Ansel in the door at a round rock um, really high on Texas. It just makes sense. He's from round rock. Right. But yeah. you know, most of these guys I talked to, are saying they want to take their time. I don't get the impression that any of them are running out to, to commit anytime soon. You know, we may see some of that later in the spring, mm-hmm. uh, certainly in the summer. Um, you know, talking to Ansel, it's pretty interesting. He goes to Round Rock. I mean, I think he literally lives like down the street from me. Not that that's interesting <laughs> to anybody watching this video, but he was kind of telling me where he lives. I'm like, wait a second, dude, that's kind of close to where I live. And I told him the street I live on. He goes, yeah, we're right there. I go, all right, we'll have to. <laughs> to come to your house and do a video. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, another big one I talked to this week, uh, Malik Muhammad, the Rivals 100 DB out of South Oak Cliff. I know you've seen these guys play quite a bit, Cole, including in the state championship. Um, you know, that's a guy Texas is really working on. I think Texas is in the fight there, certainly, but he's got almost 50 scholarship offers. It's going to be a national uh, recruiting yeah, it will be a national recruitment there. But, um, yeah, you know, a lot of good things to say about Texas. Uh, Terry Joseph's getting involved prior to that, uh, more involved. Prior to that, he'd uh, been dealing with some other assistant coaches, um, including Jeff Banks. But, you know, Texas is really trying to pick up the pressure there a little bit. So Yeah, I believe he told me after one of the playoff games, his cousin plays uh, basketball, women's basketball at Texas. You know, yeah, vaguely remember, I remember you mentioning that, yeah. But, yeah, so, I mean, they got some connections there. Don't want to steal your thunder or anything. But. No, 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 you're good, dude. Um, 
Yeah, so other we, names a like, team to watch there too is Marcus Freeman. They're doing a great job recruiting Dallas. Yeah. But yeah, Texas, I think it's in that race for sure. Good point. Yeah, I, I agree with you on Notre Dame. I think they'll be a team that's a, it's a threat there. So um, we'll see. You know, he told me in January before the dead period, he got out and went to see Alabama, uh, LSU, and Miami. So when I say it's going to be a national recruitment, yeah. there's, there's your proof right there. So um, we'll keep, you know, beating the pavement working the phones. It's a dead period right now, Cole, the whole month of February, which is just so weird to me. Usually February, this is your first kind of full year with Orange Bloods. February traditionally is one of the busier recruiting months, man. That's when you had junior days and camps, all that crap, a little different this year. Um, Even at Mississippi uh, State, we would think, you know, we just had signing days. Maybe we get a couple weeks off. No, we would have junior days. No, exactly. Not anymore. Yeah. Um, And it's funny, like, I kind of, missed my window i said you know i need to remember that for next year february is the time when we should be taking our vacation i know you, a lot of college coaches right now are like out of country on vacation yeah. I'm like damn it <laughs> why did i think, think of that i'm plugging everything exactly man so next february you and i are taking vacation brothers. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably done. not together but uh we'll, we'll, we'll communicate while we're in separate locations but um I want to ask uh just a few questions here that were sent in by orange bloods readers um, I've already answered these. I did a Q&A on Orange Bloods, but I'm, I'll kind of touch base. And I want to kind of hear your input, Cole. Um, someone asked, how many wide receivers does Texas take in the 2023 class? Those numbers are always hard to pin down, right? They're always pretty flexible. But generally, how many do we think they'll take? And does Texas lead with any wide receivers that, that you can think of in that 2023 class? Kind of your thoughts on wide receiver class or wide receiver recruiting in 2023? Yeah, I was actually thinking about writing an article either for the war room or just for, uh, you know, just for the front page, whatever. Because um, they're after a lot of receivers, especially up here in the Dallas area. Um, obviously down there near Austin with Braylon James and everything you were hoping to get an update on. Um, but I think Kyle Parker is a guy that immediately jumps to mind. Um, he's a guy that kind of a little bit off the radar until Texas offered him, but he out of Lucas Lovejoy, you know, he's kind of heated up on the recruiting scene. You know, Penn State's offered him. Um, Pitt offered when wide receivers coach Brendan Marion was up there. Then he re-offered at the junior day. He's a guy that I think that could be, if they're willing to take him early, they could jump into the class. Um, I think he's taking a visit to Louisville. He's taking some other visits, but he's a really good player. He's kind of close with Jonte Cook out of DeSoto. He trains with Margin Hook, so he's kind of well-connected there. Good relationship with Coach Marion. So I think that's the guy to keep an eye on. Um, he has some versatility. He's a, you know, punt, punt, kick returner. He's placing the slot, can play outside. I'm a big fan of his. Um, I don't know if they, I want to say they lead for him, but John T. Cook's another guy. I think Texas has been on for a while and I think he still really likes Texas. Um, I remember him telling me after a playoff game that AM has, you know, the, on field success, you know, all of that kind of stuff. But Texas has the scheme, the scheme to get those players. And that's something he's looking at. Um, he's always been a big believer in Sark. I think, I think he's a guy that could wait to see how Texas does. And now I'm sure the Longhorns fans hate to hear that, waiting to see the on field for recruits. But I think he's a guy that probably wants to see how Quinn looks. He might uh, want to see where Arch Manning goes. I know they're pretty tied in together. So I think those are two guys to keep an eye on. Braylon James just visited. Um, like Mikhail Harrison pilot. He's another guy that could play receiver playing the secondary. Um, but yeah, they're out there a lot of receivers. I think it's pretty obvious. Sark wants to upgrade that position on the roster. He, um, obviously he missed on some big time talent this past year's class, but you added Isaiah Nair and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's a couple of guys, I'd say Kyle Parker might be the guy to keep an eye on it. Like I said, they're willing to take him early. Jonte Cook's probably the guy that they really, really want to add Dy- dynamic player. Um, that kind of reminds you of, you know, Xavier Worthy, kind of in the mode of Evan Stewart, just a fast guy. So I think those are some names to keep an eye on. I think you literally almost just read my answer for my Q&A there, man. I had Isaiah <laughs> maybe being mentioned. You know, he still has three years to play, so that could impact the numbers. But they only yeah. took two guys last year, so they're going to take a pretty big class. I think they're going to have to recruit nationally. Mm-hmm. I, there's just not a ton of elite mm-hmm. talent in the state. Mm-hmm. Like you, I think Jonte Cook, probably Texas or Texas A&M. Yeah, I mentioned Kyle Parker, two guys that aren't true receivers, but they're kind of receiver hybrid tight ends. Uh, Jaden Greathouse and Lafayette, yeah, Kiway, um, mm-hmm. more flex tight end guys. But those are guys I think that Texas is in a pretty good 
yeah. uh, position with. And next one, Cole, this is pretty quick, but if you could add one recruit that Texas missed on, who would you add to make the biggest difference? And I'll tell you who I went with just to give you a little bit of time to think. Yeah. Um, I said Denver Harris just because I think Texas has such a need in the secondary. Um, you know, you can point to running back or obviously, you know, you could say uh, an offensive lineman. And they recruited great players across the board, Bear Alexander, but I just think they had a need in, in the secondary at quarterback in particular. So I went with Denver Harris is my pick. Yeah, Denver's a good pick. Um, I'll be a little bit different just because – you know, I don't want to say the same answer. One guy that pops in my mind is Bryce Anderson. You know, yeah. when I first started, I think Texas was probably in the lead. You know, I started in July, late July. Yeah, they weren't, and then they were about when yeah. you started. Yeah. Seemed like they were in pretty good position to land him, and, you know, things went south. It's not for a and I'll also say, you know, they Carol picked Perkins up. Carol been a great one, too, but just Carol because Perkins. they have such a needed yeah. linebacker. Yeah. Great, yeah. He's a great player. I, I was also say, you know, they picked up Nair, but Evan Stewart, I think, is still – a miss that probably Texas fans are kind of sour about, you know, I'd arguably probably led to, you know, on a uh, wide receiver change, you know, coaching change there, um, forced them to, you know, go out and get in there, kind of stopped them from getting the momentum because it's not like you went out of state to Alabama or Florida, you went to your in-state rival after it seemed like he was, you know, a Texas lean, you know, he's committed to Texas at one point, dynamic player. I'd say, I mean, you get in there, so you might not be the biggest miss, but if you had a town like Evan Stewart opposite of Xavier Worthy, I think that would go a long way. So I'll, I'll go with Stewart, but Denver Harris is a really good answer because of the position he plays. And as we record, someone decided to ring my doorbell and my dog get riled up in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Beauty of recording at home, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and then last one, Cole. Um, you mentioned Texas a a lot on these videos because they recruited so well last cycle, but what would you change to disrupt the flow of talent that's been going to Texas A&M? What does Texas need to do to change that? I mean, I guess the obvious answer is you got to win football games. You can't have another five and seven, obviously. You can't really, I don't think you can afford to have another eight and four kind of year either. I think you kind of have to at least get to nine wins, push for 10 and this year. Um, we'll see how Quinn plays, but I think you just have to win games to be able to counter that because a and um, obviously has the momentum. They went eight and four, but they did beat Alabama. They came coming off a year where they nearly made the college football playoff. They have some momentum there. And I really think not only that, uh, just getting to the SEC, if you can get a date, hey, we'll be in the SEC by this day, by 2023, by 2024. I think that's the reason why Harold Perkins kind of moved on from Texas and players like that. I'm not saying Harold would have definitely signed Texas, but I think if he knew they were playing in the SEC, they would have probably gotten more interest. Just talking to him. He's a guy that wanted to play in the SEC through and through. And if you, just, if you can win some games and if you can tell recruits, hey, we'll be in the SEC by then, um, I think that would pay off pretty big. Yeah, all good answers. And I mentioned Malik Muhammad, the Rivals 100 DB. He said that to me just this week. He goes, oh, it helps that they're going to the SEC. Yeah. I just wish I knew when they were going to the SEC. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, you, you can't really sell it until you know when you're going to be there and how many years these kids will be playing in the SEC. But, yeah, yeah you said it. I mean, it boils down to – when I answered it, I said, what can they do to change momentum? Don't go five and seven. <laughs> Don't lose to a team like Kansas at home. Yeah. And have a marquee win like A&M did against Alabama. I mean, do those things in Texas immediately shoots back up to the top uh, recruiting destination in the state. That wasn't the case. Yeah last year or the last couple of years truthfully but Real Texas, quick, yeah Kansas game this kind of tying into the beginning this Devon Campbell took his official visit there that weekend and it's funny I wanted to put my prediction in that week of him going to Texas that I talked to him that week the days prior to that game but then they lost to Kansas and like <laughs> everybody's gonna laugh at me I put if I put this prediction in now <laughs> <laughs> but talking to him after signing day talking to him and you know his family's uncle and all that they're like Man, that energy of the stadium kind of sold us that if they're, if they're this crazy for an overtime game against Kansas, what's going to happen when they're having an up year? You know, if there's if their fans are this involved, if their fans are this electric for this kind of game, imagine what's going to be like if they're, you know, having a great year playing against, you know, like Baylor, Alabama, they're playing Alabama this year, Some, somebody like that, you know. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Him and, him and NATO were both, you know, together on that visit. And uh, it seemed like that's a game that 
usually probably tank recruiting, especially for like right. a five star prospect. But he's the guy. He told me so. I didn't really care about the result. It was just a cool experience, which I, which I thought was pretty interesting. But but yeah. yeah, for the most part, I say you can't lose that kind of game for sure. Who would have ever thought the Kansas game could have actually helped Texas <laughs> recruiting? But they also <laughs> used that to say, "Look, man, you, we need you to come in and play yeah. right away." So there's always different angles you can play. Point in recruiting but uh all right cole well, good stuff man um uh we've gone a little longer than i even anticipated I always some, sometimes think oh there's not a whole lot to talk about and then we just get rolling and find things yeah. to talk about but uh i'm jason sukamel that's cole patterson uh we appreciate everybody watching this is our your orange bloods youtube channel hit the like button hit the sub subscribe button help us out uh we'll be back next week we're gonna make a promise uh, i hate to break a promise but we plan on being back next week to record another one of these. Who knows, Cole, maybe someday we'll even do two in a week if we're feeling crazy <laughs> or something like that. But uh, all right, everybody, well, thanks for watching. You guys have a great week and we will talk to you soon. Take care.